2012, Nicole Benjoino. Divorced schoolteacher Nicole Benjoino was the head of the special education department at a middle school in Palm Beach County, Florida, when she dumped her lawyer boyfriend for a Brazilian busboy 10 years her junior named Emerson. The pair married in 2009, and Nicole soon discovered that Emerson was selling illegal steroids out of their home in Washington. He eventually added other drugs to his inventory, and at some point, Nicole got involved in the business. The drug dealing went on for years before authorities were tipped off to a GBL shipment from China that Emerson received in 2017. A subsequent search of the Benjoino's home turned up a large supply of drugs including fentanyl, pain pills, 24,000 Xanax pills, and 16.5 liters of the party drug GBL. Authorities also uncovered guns, a ledger containing detailed records of drug sales, and over $400,000 in cash, as well as text messages proving that Nicole helped run the illicit business. Shortly after being released on bond, Emerson emptied his bank account and fled to Brazil, which doesn't extradited citizens to the United States. Several months later, federal authorities arrested three alleged co-conspirators, including Nicole Benjoino. After realizing it was in her best interest to cooperate, Nicole opened up to investigators about how the business worked. The drugs were mostly imported in bulk quantities from China. They were paid for with Bitcoin and were delivered to a UPS box that the group rented under a fake name. Then, using pill presses, the group compressed the substances into counterfeit tablets. Searches of the suspects' devices revealed that they were all aware that they were putting lives at risk by selling fentanyl disguised as painkillers like Percocet and Oxycodone. In court, Nicole's lawyer argued that the suburban school teacher was sucked into the drug-selling scheme out of desperation to keep her trophy husband happy. She pleaded guilty to one count of possessing illegal drugs with intent to distribute and was sentenced to two and a half years in federal prison followed by three years of probation. 11. Joanne Segovia By all appearances, 64-year-old Joanne Segovia was a suburban grandmotherly type and an upstanding citizen. She spent 20 years working for the San Jose Police Officers Association in California, where she eventually worked her way up to the role of executive director. So, it's no wonder that it came as a surprise to her community and colleagues when she was arrested in 2023 for allegedly shipping large amounts of illegal drugs to locations all over the United States. According to prosecutors, Segovia received at least 61 drug-filled packages from India, Hong Kong, Singapore, Hungary, and other countries over a more than seven-year period starting in late 2015. The shipments were falsely labeled as makeup, chocolate, party favors, and other ordinary items. But in reality, the packages contained dangerous and deadly drugs, including fentanyl. At least two of Segovia's packages were intercepted and seized by authorities over the years. But she wasn't personally investigated until 2022, when her name was linked to a drug distributing network in India that was known for shipping its products to the US. Messages exchanged among the group's members contained Segovia's name and address, along with information about shipments. Segovia covered her tracks so well that nobody in her life suspected her of being involved in anything illegal, let alone an international drug operation. Even her husband, Domingo Segovia, was most likely unaware of her alleged crimes, according to a relative, who told the New York Post that he would have never tolerated that type of activity in his home. Federal authorities charged Segovia with unlawfully attempting to import valeryl fentanyl, and if convicted, she could face up to 20 years in prison. According to a Homeland Security Investigations report, Segovia tried pinning the blame on her housekeeper, who she claimed had a substance abuse problem. As of October 2023, she was free without supervision and had not been in court since months earlier, leading to speculation that she was cooperating with authorities in exchange for leniency. Sadly, the outcome of the case remains to be seen. 10. Brittany Simone Smith 26-year-old Brittany Simone Smith was homeless and six months pregnant when she vanished in early February 2021. Several days later, her body was found stuffed in a purple suitcase near the Noise River in Raleigh, North Carolina. Unfortunately, she'd been strangled to death. 
At the time of her disappearance, Smith was living in a tent behind an acquaintance's house with her boyfriend of seven years, Cody Page, who reported her missing when she failed to return after being gone more than 24 hours. Page told local news station WRAL that Smith had a secret life that she refused to tell him about and that it involved drugs. Investigators managed to track down Smith's phone, which revealed that she was last in contact with 37-year-old Thomas Johnson and 24-year-old Emily Grace Trevathan. They paid a visit to Trevathan's parents, who said that they'd recently seen their daughter and Johnson leaving their house with a purple suitcase. Evidence and the motel room where the couple was staying further tied them to Brittany's murder. Johnson and Trevathan were charged with murder, murder of an unborn child, and concealment of a body. According to prosecutors, one of the suspects murdered Smith in the couple's van while the other drove. The defendants were convicted on all counts and were sentenced to life in prison without parole. But their motive for committing the horrific act of violence remains unclear. 9. Robert Konoshewicz As a Toronto police officer, Robert Konoshewicz made over $100,000 per year, which is plenty for most single people without kids to survive on. But he was a big spender with a penchant for the finer things in life, and he lost copious amounts of money to bad investments. His former partner, Candy Stixon, noticed his tendency to mismanage finances early on in their relationship. But she loved Konoshewicz and had her own money, so she overlooked it. In 2018, eight years into the couple's relationship, Dixon discovered that Konoshewicz was having an affair and kicked him out of their condo. Then, several months later, she discovered suspicious documents Konoshewicz had received regarding the estate of a deceased loner named Heinz Sommerfeld, who'd passed away the previous year. The letters contained the name of Connor Shewich's mistress, Adeline Balgobin, who worked for Ontario's Office of the Public Guardian and Trustee, OPGT. When someone dies and has no will or no next of kin, the agency is tasked with handling the person's finances and attempting to identify a rightful heir to their estate. Suspecting some sort of fraud, Dixon passed the information on to the police, who proceeded to uncover a twisted tale of deception, betrayal, and large-scale theft. Connor Shewich had met Balgobin four years earlier in 2014 while working security in her office. He lied to Balgobin about having a partner at first, and the two began an affair. But when Balgobin wondered why Connor Shewich never invited her over, he claimed that he lived with his ex but that they were separated. And when recent photos on social media proved the couple was still very much together, Balgobin overlooked it and continued seeing Connor Shewich anyway. After Sommerfeld's death in 2017, Connor Shewich and Balgobin hatched a plan to draft a fake will, leaving his entire estate to Connor Shewich. Balgobin signed documents testifying to the authenticity of Sommerfeld's signature, while Connor Shewich concocted a story about how he'd befriended the deceased senior citizen years earlier at a horse racing track. In the meantime, an employee at the OPGT identified Sommerfeld's half-brother as his next of kin. The two had fallen out of touch years earlier, after Sommerfeld became senile and stopped associating with his family. Sommerfeld's brother was excited to learn that he was slated to inherit nearly $800,000, but he never saw the money thanks to the bogus will that Konoshewicz and Balgobin had concocted. Konoshewicz had received Sommerfeld's entire estate. Luckily, though, investigators discovered the fraud quickly enough to stop him from spending it all. They froze Konoshewicz's accounts in 2019, and in 2020, they arrested Konoshewicz and Balgobin. Both suspects were suspended from their jobs pending the outcome of the case. They were found guilty of fraud in 2023 and are each facing up to nine years in prison. The convicted couple's sentencing hearing was scheduled for October of that same year, but there have been no updates on the outcome of the proceeding. Following the guilty verdicts, the remaining $684,000 from Sommerfeld's estate was finally awarded to his half-brother. 8. Danica Childs Just days before Christmas in 2011, Danica Childs failed to show up for a planned holiday shopping trip with her mother Diane Zorro in Federal Way, Washington. 
Nothing had seemed amiss when the two spoke earlier that day, although the teen's mother had tried to call her back several times and the phone went straight to voicemail. Zoro initially thought Danica's phone had died, but now she began to worry that something more sinister was at play. Her fears only grew when she learned that Danica's purse, coat, and cell phone had been found at a local hotel known for drugs and prostitution. And when Zoro listened to her daughter's voicemail, it became evident that Danica was working as an escort. Zoro also suspected that she was being trafficked. Shortly before she vanished, Danica had dropped out of high school after falling behind in an advanced program. She eventually re-enrolled and was sent to graduate on time when she went missing. Police initially classified her as a runaway, but Zoro didn't believe that her daughter would abandon her life just as she was getting on track. At the time of her disappearance, Danica was dating a man who her mother believes was her pimp. But Zoro reportedly had to find tooth and nail to convince law enforcement to examine the case as a possible human trafficking situation. Twelve years later, Danica remains missing, leaving her loved ones without the answers they desperately long for. 7. Jeffrey Michaels in a case that stumped law enforcement for decades to come, a U.S. airman named Jeffrey Michaels vanished from the Mino Air Force Base in North Dakota in July of 1977. He simply failed to report to work one day while on active duty, leaving behind no discernible trace of his fate or whereabouts. The case had been long forgotten when a missing veterans organization posted Michael's photo to its Facebook page in 2017, 40 years after he disappeared. A few months later, authorities announced that Michael's had been found in Sanford, Florida, where he'd been living under the alias Jeffrey Lance for an unknown number of years. After ditching the military, he'd got married, fathered four children, and started a construction business, which had registered under his alias in 1998. Also, bought a house under the name Jeffrey Lance. According to McClatchy News, Michaels was positively identified by a distinctive scar on his leg. It's unclear whether the Facebook post generated a tip that helped lead to Michaels' whereabouts if it prompted the Air Force to take a fresh look at the case or if something else led to him being discovered. The page's administrator, Amelia Pert, told People magazine that many of the missing veterans the page posts about end up being linked to John Doe or Jane Doe cases. She said that she was surprised by the outcome of Michael's case and that she was glad he was alive. The 64-year-old was charged with military desertion and was extradited back to North Dakota on the same day of his arrest. According to the New York Post, the statute of limitations for prosecuting the crime had run out, so he managed to avoid a court-martial for going AWOL. The Post further reported that Michaels was released with an other-than-honorable military discharge, while other news sources claim that there's no statute of limitations on military desertion and that Michaels would, in fact, face charges. But it's unclear what became of the case, and Michaels' reasons for deserting the military were never released. 6. Ana Montez during the 1990s, the FBI began to suspect that there was a Cuban spy working within the highest ranks of the American intelligence community. They spent nearly a decade working to identify a suspect before finally landing on Ana Belen Montez, a senior analyst for the Defense Intelligence Agency. Montez caught the attention of Cuban spy recruiters during the mid-1980s when she was working as a clerk for the U.S. Department of Justice. Despite holding a government job, she was openly critical of America's policies towards Central America. It was the best combination of traits that a recruiter could hope for while scouting for a spy who was willing to betray their own country and had the means to do it. To gain access to classified information, Montez applied for and landed a job with the DIA. From the moment she began her career with the agency, she was a full-fledged spy. Instead of copying or removing documents from her workplace, she memorized the information she wanted to pass on and then typed it up on her personal computer at home. She loaded the documents onto encrypted disks and passed them onto her handler during their clandestine meetings, which were arranged over shortwave radio while speaking in code. In the meantime, Montez worked her way up through the ranks of the DIA, eventually becoming the agency's top Cuban analyst. 
but she fell under suspicion several times due to the controversial views she had expressed in the past and because of her behavior on the job. And in 1996, a colleague reported his suspicions that Montez was under Cuban influence. But any time she was questioned, she denied any wrongdoing, and she even passed a polygraph. Montez's downfall finally came after the colleague who suspected her of being a spy learned in the year 2000 that the FBI was searching for a Cuban mole. He once again shared his suspicions, and this time an investigation was launched. During a covert search of Montez's apartment, FBI agents discovered a laptop filled with years' worth of classified intelligence information. Then, over the next year, they continued to collect evidence and conducted extended surveillance on Montez, hoping to catch her in a face-to-face -face meeting with her handler. But the need to arrest Montez became urgent shortly after the 9-11 terrorist attacks, when she was assigned to a role that would give her access to sensitive US war plans. To prevent that from happening, authorities made their move and charged her with conspiracy to commit espionage. One of the most shocking aspects of Montez's double life is the fact that she kept it a secret from everyone in her life, including her family members, several of whom worked for the FBI. She also never accepted payment for her spying activities beyond reimbursement for basic costs. Montez provided her services free of charge because she disagreed with US foreign policy. And to this day, she is considered one of the most damaging spies in American history. In 2002, she pleaded guilty as charged and received a 25-year prison sentence. She was released in 2023 and will remain under post-release supervision for five years, which includes monitoring of her internet activities. In a statement to BBC News following her release, she announced her plans to live a quiet and private existence. Montez also made it clear that she continues to sympathize with the plight of the Cuban people and remains critical of the US embargo against the country. 5. Jason Heiter British career soldier Jason Heiter married Tracy Larkham in 2010 after divorcing his first wife due to chronic cheating. Early on in the relationship, Larkham was contacted by Heiter's ex-wife, Teresa Fortune, who tried to warn her about his philandering ways. But the advice went unheeded and Larkham continued with the relationship. Heiter and Larkham lived in Germany, but Heiter spent long periods away from home in the UK while blaming his absences on his military job. The same year he married Larkham, he started a romantic relationship with a British woman named Sarah. By 2015, he had two children with Larkham and one child with Sarah. He then married Sarah in 2016, despite still being married to Larkham. Then, in 2018, he and Sarah had twins. Heiter managed to keep the women from knowing about each other for years. It was easy for them to believe that his prolonged trips away from home were work-related. And when he continued to disappear after leaving the army in 2014, Heiter claimed that he was away for training as a paramedic or blamed his mental health. One day, during one of his many absences from his home in Germany, Heiter texted Tracy Larkham saying that he didn't love her anymore and that he was gay. He allegedly abandoned his life in Germany entirely, failing to carry on a relationship with his children and leaving Larkham burdened with debt. The truth about Heiter's double life finally came out when one of Sarah's children sent Larkham a message on social media asking what her connection to her father was. Sarah went to the police and Heiter was charged with bigamy, which can carry a prison sentence of up to seven years. He pleaded guilty and received a suspended prison sentence, with his military service and a recent stroke serving as mitigating factors that spared him from serving any time behind bars. Heiter was accompanied to his court proceedings by his new partner, Sarah Taylor, who seems to believe he's capable of being faithful after spending his entire adult life cheating on women. Teresa Fortune, the first wife who tried to warn Tracy Larkham, contacted Taylor and warned her that a tiger doesn't change its stripes and that Heiter's infidelity spans decades. But Taylor seems undeterred by Fortune's words of caution, and the couple is reportedly engaged. Meanwhile, reports claim that Heiter's ex-wives have completely cut ties and want nothing to do with him. 4. Peter Chadwick Nicknamed QC, 
Kuei Chu Lim Chanwick was a stay-at-home mom to her multi-millionaire husband and college sweetheart, Peter Chanwick. They lived in an upscale gated neighborhood in Newport, California, where violent crime is practically unheard of. Needless to say, it came as a shock when QC disappeared from the family's mansion in 2012 and was never seen or heard from again. The next day, Peter Chadwick dialed 911 and claimed that a painter he'd hired named Juan had murdered QC and kidnapped him afterward. He called from San Diego, roughly 90 miles from the family's home, and said that Juan had forced him to travel over the border and dispose of QC's body in Mexico. Authorities didn't buy Chadwick's story though, and he was arrested that day on suspicion of QC's murder. A week later, QC's body was found in a dumpster at a local gas station, and sadly she'd been bludgeoned and strangled to death. After sitting in jail for two months, Chadwick bonded out for $1 million. He regularly attended his court appearances for two years as the case dragged out in court. Then, in January 2015, Chadwick vanished, leaving him and QC's three sons in the care of a relative. Before he disappeared, he told his family he was heading to Seattle, leading investigators to suspect that he may have fled to Canada. But in reality, he'd walked across the border into Mexico and was jumping from town to town while using different aliases. Chadwick eventually settled down in a town called Batscuaro. He told curious locals that his family had died in the ill-fated Malaysian Airlines Flight 370 that had vanished over the ocean in 2014. His stay in Batscuaro ended in 2016 after a car accident resulting in his friend's death threatened to draw unwanted attention and legal scrutiny. From there, he moved to a town called Valle de Bravo, where he taught English and worked as a dishwasher. But it's hard to be one of America's 15 most wanted fugitives and avoid being discovered. After seeing himself on a news broadcast one day after nearly five years on the run, he fled Valle de Bravo and relocated to the city of Cholula, where he avoided going out as much as possible out of fear of being recognized. Finally, though, in August 2019, authorities traced Chadwick to Cholula through a call he placed to California from a payphone. They soon learned that they'd caught him just in time and that he was planning to free Cholula the next day. Chadwick pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and was sentenced to 15 years to life in prison. And under California's law, he's required to serve 85% of his sentence, which means that he could see freedom again after as little as 12 years. 3. Phoenix Colden 23-year-old Phoenix Colden was last seen leaving her parents' home in St. Louis in her mother's SUV. But she never returned, and it wasn't until weeks later that her family learned the SUV had been found abandoned across state lines in East St. Louis, Illinois, just hours after she left. As Colden's family and friends searched for her, they began to suspect that she was leading a double life. Her parents discovered that she'd had a secret boyfriend of five years, and that the couple had lived together in an apartment that Colden's parents had co-signed the lease for. She also had a second cell phone, which she was using to communicate with several other men. On the day Colden vanished, she left without telling her parents, which was unusual. They assumed she'd just gone to the store or to run a quick errand. But when they finally located the missing SUV in an impound lot weeks later, they discovered that the police had not gone out of their way to identify the vehicle's owner or examine its contents. An officer allegedly told the Coldens that there were no personal belongings inside the SUV. But when they looked, they found the missing girl's purse, glasses, driver's license, and shoes. Police failed to give the case the attention that the family felt it deserved, and it received little media coverage, which the family suspected was due to Colden's race. Left with no other choice, the family carried out their own investigation. They discovered that Colden had two birth certificates, one in her birth name and one under her adoptive stepfather's name. Shortly before she went missing, she posted a video online talking about how she'd been unhappy for as long as she could remember and wanted to start over. In 2014, a friend of Colden claimed that she saw the young woman while boarding a flight from Las Vegas to St. Louis. Kelly Fronhard later told the Oxygen Channel that she called Colden's name and the woman turned and looked at her but kept walking. 
She said that Colden was traveling with a group of several women and two large athletic-looking men. When the plane landed, Fronhurt immediately told airport staff that she thought she saw a missing person on the flight. So, police searched the airport, but sadly, they failed to find the woman. A family friend named Jeffrey Hargrove also claimed to have seen Colden on two separate occasions in downtown St. Louis following her disappearance, but she remains missing to this day. Some believe that she was kidnapped into human trafficking, while others suspect that she abandoned her life for a new start. There are also theories of foul play, including suspicions against her secret boyfriend, who's being cleared as a person of interest. But many believe Colden may still be alive. Her family hopes to find out what happened to her, but for now, the mystery lingers. 2. Stephen Orwine in 2016, someone contacted a dark web murder-for-hire website requesting for a hitman to take out a 43-year-old Minnesota woman named Amy Allwine. Writing under the username Dog Day God, the person accused Amy of sleeping with their husband and attempting to destroy their career. The website, Beza Mafia, claims to have connection with Albanian organized crime. In reality, though, it doesn't provide paid assassins. Like with most other murder-for-hire sites on the dark web, its administrators are happy to take payments from gullible people who think its services are real. The messages requesting Amy's murder fell into FBI hands after a group of hackers broke into the site. Amy Allwine owned a dog training business and was a devout member of her church, where her husband, Stephen, served as an elder and a marriage counselor. She wasn't the type of person to have a lot of enemies or be involved in nefarious activities, so it was hard to imagine who might want her dead. The FBI warned Amy about the attempt on her life and investigated several people, but found no evidence that any of them were involved. Six months later, in November 2016, officers responded to an emergency call at the Allwine home and found Amy dead from a gunshot wound. Stephen Allwine claimed that his wife hadn't been feeling well that day and that she'd told him to stop checking on her when he showed concern for her well-being. He said that he returned home from running an errand later that day and found her unresponsive. Stephen's story didn't quite add up, though, and investigators soon began to suspect foul play. There was no gunpowder residue on Amy's hands and no evidence to indicate that the gun was close to her head when she was shot. A review of the home security system showed Stephen coming and going around the suspected time of her death, and there was a large amount of an incapacitating drug in her system that she didn't have a prescription for. Moreover, Stephen had recently cheated on Amy with at least two women he met through the Ashley Madison affair-seeking website. The Allwine's church frowned heavily upon divorce, leading authorities to suspect that Stephen saw killing Amy as the only way to end his marriage without losing his good standing as an elder. They also began to believe that Stephen was the dark web user Dog Day God, and that he took matters into his own hands after his request to have Amy killed and stage it as a car accident went unmet. Records showed that Dog Day God had paid $6,000 to base a mafia for Amy's murder and had provided the website with extremely detailed information about her that only someone close to her would know. Then, after the first hit was supposedly unsuccessful, Dog Day Good agreed to pay another $6,000 in Bitcoin and sent it to the wrong recipient. In the meantime, Stephen called his local police and claimed that he'd been defrauded by someone he'd tried to buy software from. Following Amy's death months later, the Bitcoin transactions from the attempt to hire a hitman were traced directly to Stephen. In 2018, a jury found Stephen guilty of premeditated first-degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole and remains behind bars after several unsuccessful attempts to appeal his case. And now for number one. But if you want to hear more bizarre and crazy stories, stay tuned after the video for some more content. 1. The Disappearance of Susan Osborne Divorced single mother Susan Osborne married her second husband, Jerry Osborne, in 2014 after dating for less than a year. The couple lived in Wetumpka, Alabama, with Susan's teenage son from her previous marriage, and Jerry worked as a 911 dispatcher while Susan was a stay-at-home mom. They appeared to be an average American family with a happy home life, but all that changed after Susan and her son Evan disappeared in 2017. 
Susan's mum, who lived out of state, hesitated to call the police. Her daughter had always been a private person, and she feared that Susan would get upset and think she was being overbearing if she reported her missing. In the meantime, Susan stopped responding to emails and calls from her best friend Holly Hatfield, who lived in Florida. Neither of the women knew Jerry's phone number or had any other ways to reach him. So when two months went by with no word from Susan, her mother finally called the police. Elmore County deputies visited the Osborne's home, where they found Susan's car parked in the driveway. Jerry told them that Susan had run off with another man. He was deep cleaning the house, which they found suspicious, and he gave them a medical bill for a recent missed appointment as proof that Susan was still alive. But in all honesty, that didn't make any sense. According to police, Jerry had remodeled the house, even though Susan had updated it just months before her disappearance. It also burned and replaced all of the furniture in the home. Jerry was unable to identify the man Susan had supposedly left him for, and investigators found it odd how Holly Hadfield had never heard of another man being in the picture, even though Susan told her everything. Hadfield soon dropped her bombshell on detectives. While there was no other man to speak of, Susan was thinking about leaving Jerry, who'd become extremely controlling. In a series of emails to Hadfield from the months before she vanished, Susan revealed that Jerry monitored her phone communications. It also installed an elaborate home surveillance system, which he allegedly used more for keeping Susan inside the house than keeping potential intruders out. Susan also shared a series of emails that Jerry had allegedly exchanged with another man about meeting for intimacy, along with an escort page from years earlier that featured a photo of a man who resembled Jerry. The ad stated that it was seeking an older, generous gentleman, and Susan claimed that she could tell by the tattoos in the photo that the man was, in fact, Jerry. She also suspected that her husband had continued to work as a male prostitute throughout their marriage. After making the discoveries, Susan said that she planned to confront Jerry, but then she disappeared. Jerry reportedly remains a person of interest in the case, but with no bodies and a lack of evidence, authorities don't have enough to implicate him in the case. So for now, the investigation remains open. 10. Stanislav Reshetniak Stanislav Reshetniak is the guy who killed his girlfriend on a live stream after his viewers paid him money to beat her up. In the shocking case of live streaming gone wrong, the YouTuber was sent to prison with a sentence of six years for directly causing the poor young girl's death. He was convicted of inflicting grievous bodily harm and sent to a Russian penal colony. Here's how it all unfolded. The victim in this situation was 28-year-old Valentina Gregorieva. She was subjected to a lot of abuse at the hands of Stanislav, especially on camera for people to see. He called his girlfriend a prostitute, said she was smelly, and then proceeded to verbally and physically attack her depending on what his watchers paid him to do. While streaming live, he locked her outside the house almost completely naked in sub-zero temperatures. But this was not the cause of her death. When he finally allowed her back inside, it was clear to everyone watching that she was basically dead. When she really did drop dead, someone online called the emergency services. According to the coroner, the actual cause of death wasn't the cold. It was craniocerebral trauma, caused by repeated blows to her face. Even though this guy is obviously a complete monster, his mother told reporters that he is actually very kind and would never hurt a kitten. But obviously she didn't know her son very well, seeing as he literally beat his girlfriend to death in front of a live audience. 9. Virginia News Crew Massacre It was a Wednesday morning when a southwestern Virginia television crew were in the middle of a live broadcast. Everything was totally normal as the journalists did their interview. What nobody realized was that a man standing behind them had a gun in his pocket and that he pulled it out and pointed it directly at them. 
Moments later, Allison Parker and her cameraman, Adam Ward, were shot to death in cold blood. The viewers at home were absolutely mortified. The police were able to identify the killer as Vester Lee Flanagan II, a former worker at the TV station. He also managed to clip executive director Vicki Gardner with a local chamber of commerce, but Vicki survived and made a full recovery. Broadcasting yourself killing people on TV is a sure way to get caught. Flanagan knew that he would never get out of the situation as a free man, so he took the coward's way out before the police could catch up to him. After all, his face and the murders were broadcast on television screens all across the country, and it was all over social media. Before he went down, Flanagan claimed his motive was racism from the broadcast network. He was upset because they allegedly bullied him. However, Franklin County Sheriff Bill Overton said Flanagan was just, and I quote, disturbed in some way. 8. Desperate Rooftopper A desperate rooftopper named Wu Yang Ning was live streaming a daring stunt in an attempt to make some cash for his wedding and to help pay for his mom's hospital bills. Unfortunately for him, the stunt didn't go over very well. The 26-year-old daredevil climbed 62 stories and clung to the edge of a skyscraper while holding a selfie stick and live streaming. This was in November of 2017, but while he was holding on to the side of the skyscraper, he lost his grip and tumbled all the way down to the street below. His body was later discovered by a window cleaner. So far, the disturbing clip of his death has gathered at least 15 million shares. He was lowering himself over the edge of the building to do pull-ups when he fell, as he couldn't lift himself to actually do the pull-up. And to make the story even more tragic, his plan was to propose to his girlfriend the day after the stunt. He figured that because it was so daring, he would make a ton of money and tips from his online viewers. But don't worry, ever since his death, his fans have been sending plenty of tributes to him, which will hopefully help with his mother's hospital bills. Though to be honest, she probably doesn't care that much anymore about the money. 7. Over the Edge A Russian couple were recently caught on camera taking a domestic dispute to a new low. A guy walking down the street saw a heated argument unfolding on a balcony overlooking the sidewalk. Naturally, he pulled out his phone and began to film the argument as it got louder and more violent. The couple are yelling, they're starting to shove one another, and then from out of nowhere they're falling. The couple plunged 25 feet, 7.6 meters, after teetering off the railing of their balcony. The passerby managed to catch the whole thing on video as the couple smacked onto the concrete. The bizarre fight happened in St. Petersburg, and both Olga Volkova and Yegenye Karlijing suffered broken limbs from their fall. Apparently, the railing couldn't sustain their weight as they struggled together against it. This caused the railing to break, for the couple to fall, and for the passerby to get some great unexpected footage for his stream. Sometimes the most interesting streams happen totally by accident. Hopefully next time, the disastrous couple will keep their arguing inside, out of the view of the public and away from any dangerous ledges. 6. Cat Filter Everywhere The cat filter is causing some serious problems all across the world with people who don't quite understand how to live stream. One of the most hilarious examples just happened a few weeks ago when the Canadian police had to apologize for technical difficulties that resulted in an absolutely bizarre news conference. The conference was about a double murder, something that doesn't need any added comedy. They were live streaming the conference on Facebook and somebody had accidentally applied the cat filter. So while Sergeant Janelle Choyat of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police discussed a grisly double murder, 
she happened to have a cartoon cat ears and whiskers. The murder itself involved an American woman and her boyfriend from Australia who were killed in a fatal shootout on a remote stretch of highway in the province of British Columbia. Naturally, the families of those involved weren't too impressed with the cat whiskers. But what's your favorite cat filter blunder? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. 5. The Cleveland Killer Back in April of 2017, there was a nationwide manhunt for a man who shot somebody to death while filming the murder on Facebook Live. The suspect was Steve Stevens, who said in a disturbing follow-up video to the murder that he had already killed 13 people and was in the middle of a killing spree. He said he would murder many more. The poor victim was Robert Godwin, 74 years old. Robert was walking home from having Easter lunch on a peaceful Sunday afternoon when Steve targeted him at random and streamed it all live as he shot the man to death. What really disturbed people at the time, unsurprisingly, wasn't actually the death of the old man, but the fact that Facebook allowed the video to stay on its site for hours. Millions of people watched the brutal killing before Facebook finally realized what was happening and took the video down. The first complaint apparently came in two hours after, but it was even longer before the video was removed. It was also quite a while before the police figured out what was going on and issued a photograph of Steve Stevens and put out an arrest warrant. The manhunt did eventually catch Steve after he was spotted in Pennsylvania. Out of all the places he could have gone, he drove his car into a McDonald's drive through where somebody recognized him and called the cops. 4. Cooking Show Catastrophe in Thailand, an internet celebrity had the worst live stream cooking show in history. She didn't mess up the recipe or accidentally cook herself in a giant bowl of soup. Instead, she simply fell to the ground and died while cooking for her online fans. Those who were watching her live stream were positively shocked. The celebrity Pai Ping was just getting started with her daily video. She had her pink apron on. She was all set to show her viewers how to cook some yummy food, and she was smiling and seemed totally happy. But then, totally out of nowhere, she slipped and fell forward, hit the floor, and died. Nobody knew what happened at the time of the string. Peng's husband rushed to her rescue and turned off the camera. It wasn't until much later that one of Peng's relatives logged onto her account and revealed the disturbing news of her death. An autopsy revealed that she had suffered heart failure from the sudden onset of heart disease. Nobody even knew that she was sick, as she had never been diagnosed with any kind of disease. It must have come on fast, been subtle enough that she never realized she was sick, and then that was it. Before she could even complete her cooking show, her heart gave out in front of her terrified fans. 3. Machete-Wielding Robbers In the United Kingdom, a high-speed chase was filmed from the perspectives of a trio of machete-wielding robbers as they tried to get away from the police. This unbelievable group actually streamed themselves live in the car as they tried to escape the authorities. It happened in Kent after the three men robbed a guy at knife point. Well, more like at machete point, which is arguably worse. The robbers were Ifiang Nisa, Salah Ibrahim, and Shamil Ibrahim. One of the men pulled out the machete and told the victim to give him everything he had. The victim tried to run but was chased down, knocked to the ground, and then forced to hand over the huge amount of cash he had on him. It was about $20 American. Once they got the measly 20 bucks, they got into their car and sped away, but not before turning on the live stream. The car chase itself was incredibly dangerous. The trio sped through red lights, they drove directly toward oncoming vehicles, and they even went the wrong way through a roundabout. But despite their brave driving moves, 
The officers were able to stop the car before anybody got hurt. All three suspects were dragged out of the vehicle and arrested. All three were sentenced to spend several years in prison, between two and four years each. 2. Live Stream Vigilantes In New York City, you can now make $200 a day as a live streaming vigilante. Let me explain how it works. If you rush to the scene of a murder, a fire, or even a traffic accident, and you pull out your phone when you get there and start filming, you could make a nice cash payday. At least that's the pitch from a new controversial neighborhood watch application. The developers of this app are sneakily hiring everyday New Yorkers to live stream crimes. The app is called Citizen, and it was created in an effort to encourage ordinary citizens to be more involved with public emergencies. So far, this bizarre live streaming app has raised at least $133 million, with many of their backers coming from Silicon Valley. The app is promising to give real-time safety alerts to people where they live and where they work. If you happen to be in the right place at the right time and you film something awful happening, you can live stream that video and get the cash. It's a weird way to turn everybody in New York City with a phone into a vigilante. One of the users, a guy who goes by the name Chris, spends his days bicycling around the Bronx while chasing emergencies. So far, he has streamed 1,600 crimes and accidents, earning himself quite a bit of cash. 1. Too Young to Joyride A mom in Connecticut has gotten into some serious trouble after police caught her letting her 10-year-old son drive her car on public roads. How did she get caught? You guessed it. She streamed the bizarre event live on Facebook. Lisa Nussbaum, 38, from the town of Monroe, put her little kid behind the wheel of the car and then streamed it for all her friends to watch because she thought it was absolutely adorable. But it wasn't that adorable. The 10-year-old kid was hardly big enough to reach the pedals, he definitely didn't know how to drive, and he could have easily driven through a stop sign or run somebody over on the sidewalk. Don't worry, the mother did not get away with it. Lisa was charged with risk of injury and impairing morals of a minor. She wasn't sent to jail, but was instead released with a promise to appear and will probably just get a slap on the wrist. The moral of the story is that if you're going to let an infant drive your car, maybe don't stream it for the whole world to watch. Or then again, Maybe don't do it at all. Number 10. Shot Down at Walmart If you think you've seen some terrifying things at Walmart, wait till you hear about what a 31-year-old woman did in Louisiana. According to the police, Kayla Giles shot her estranged husband to death in a Walmart parking lot early on a Saturday morning. Her husband, Thomas Coote Jr., was supposed to be picking up the kids for a custody exchange when she pulled out a gun and shot him in the chest. And what better place to commit murder than at Walmart? The police were called immediately. First responders arrived on the scene, but Thomas was unable to be revived. The bullet punctured his chest and ripped his insides apart, and he bled to death. To make matters even more disturbing, all three of their children were present during the incident. This guy's wife shot him dead in front of their own kids. It's really the kids that lost in this situation, as all three had to be taken to the local police headquarters and then handed over to the Louisiana Department of Children and Family Services. Sadly, we don't know the motive for the killing. We do know that Thomas had previously filed a police complaint about his wife being dangerously violent. He had also tried to file a motion to prevent her from having custody of the kids. This is one of those rare cases where the mother probably should have had her kids taken away and full custody been given to the father. Now the mother is in jail and the father is dead. Number 9. A Bad Birthday Penelope Jackson stabbed her husband three times on her birthday. It was almost like a long-awaited present that she got for herself. Her husband, David Jackson, 
was stabbed across the chest in the bedroom. He tried to flee, and then his wife stabbed him twice more in the kitchen while he was on the phone with the police. He had managed to ring the cops, who then listened as he screamed, and his wife plunged a knife into him over and over. As the police operator was still on the line listening to a literal murder, Penelope grabbed the phone and said, He's in the kitchen, bleeding to death with any luck. Penelope then refused to give her husband any emergency aid and allowed him to bleed to death. When the police operator asked how many times she stabbed her husband, she said that she did it once. Then she said that her husband told her there was no way she'd stab him again, so she stabbed him twice more. During the court proceedings that followed, seeing as Penelope Jackson was undoubtedly guilty, Judge Martin Picton said that she did not show even a little bit of remorse for the attack. She was found guilty of murder. There wasn't really any debating what happened. Number 8. We Can't All Be Perfect A woman who got caught plotting her husband's murder has said in her defense, we're not all perfect. She also said that the murder plot was a complete mistake, but there's nothing she can do about it now. Jamie Gracek already went through with having her husband killed and is currently locked up behind bars. The murder happened back in March of 2013 in Ohio. When authorities arrived on the scene of a reported shooting, they discovered John Gracek dying in his front yard, hit by bullets in his chest and thigh. The woman near him wasn't his wife, but his new girlfriend, Nicole Price. Before the shooting, John had been married to Jamie for 11 years. Things became too much when Jamie allegedly got tired of John acting violently when he got into a bad mood and taking his anger out on her. But according to John's daughter, Jamie was no saint either. She was using drugs, she refused to get a job, and she was neglectful to her children. But of course, Jamie has denied all of these accusations. The couple separated in 2012, and Jamie found herself under immense financial strain. She lost her electricity, the state removed her children, and she was so distraught that the only thing she could think to do was get revenge on her ex-husband. She ended up hiring a couple of thugs to rob and kill Jamie, which they succeeded in doing. She was charged with involuntary manslaughter, complicit to commit aggravated robbery, and was given 21 years in jail. The two men who actually did the killing received sentences of 18 to life and 15 to life. Number 7. The Alzheimer's Scheme A woman from Connecticut in her 60s convinced her husband that he was suffering from Alzheimer's. It was part of a diabolical scheme to steal his money. The scheme went on for about 20 years, according to New Haven Police. The bad wife in this scenario is Donna Marino. She managed to steal approximately $600,000 from her husband, who is 10 years her senior. She cashed in his pension checks, his workers' compensation payments, and of course, his social security. She forged his signature on documents and checks that allowed her to deposit them into a secret bank account. And to cover her tracks, she convinced her husband that he was sick with Alzheimer's so that he wouldn't go to the bank to discover how low his balance was on his accounts. It was honestly a smart yet very evil scheme that paid off for two decades. She only got caught when the victim's adult daughter went to the police in 2019 to say that Donna had been robbing her father since 1999, and the whole time he had no idea. Donna has since been charged with first-degree larceny, though it's unclear if she'll actually do time in prison. Number 6. Too Stingy A housewife in Nigeria has been arrested after trying to have her husband kidnapped by a group of thugs. The reason behind the kidnapping was that the housewife felt her husband was too stingy with his cash. According to the police public relations officer in Ogun, where the event took place, three suspects were stopped because they looked suspicious. When the police searched these three men, they discovered weapons and rope, the tools very obviously needed for kidnapping. When they interrogated the suspects separately, all three gave different answers to the questions, confirming that something very serious was going on. In the end, the would-be kidnappers confessed that a woman had hired them to hide along the road and then ambush her husband. She was supposed to lure him into the area at a specific time. The men were supposed to tie him up with rope and demand a ransom. The three men gave up the identity of the woman. The police tracked her down, and she admitted to being the brains behind the whole operation. She claimed that kidnapping her husband and demanding a ransom was the only way that she would get any money out of him. He was too stingy and wouldn't buy her all the things that she wanted so she resorted to kidnapping. Do you think you would ever resort to kidnapping your spouse to get what you want? Maybe you've even thought of it already. 
let us know in the comments and don't forget to hit subscribe for even more awesome videos from the channel. Number 5. Dissolved in Chemicals In India, a woman has been found guilty of murdering her husband. It's not the murder itself that's overtly disturbing, but what was done after to the man's body. Let's start at the beginning. The woman, named Radha, murdered her husband with the help of a man whom she was having an affair with. This kind of thing, whether we like it or not, happens all the time. But to get rid of the evidence, Radha took things to the extreme. She first dismembered her dead husband, then pulled a move straight from Walter White's book of body disposal. She tried to dissolve his remains in a tub of chemicals, but seeing as she wasn't a proper chemist, she didn't quite know how to do it properly. Messing around with the chemicals caused a massive explosion, which brought the police down to the place where she was trying to ditch the body. She had rented an apartment to do the disposal in private. When the police showed up, they found the woman and the man she was having an affair with, along with the horribly mangled corpse of the dead man. Number 4. The Proposal A realtor in India made his wife so angry that she bludgeoned him to death with an iron rod. According to what she said when surrendering to the police, she attacked her husband because he had proposed that she take part in a wife swap with one of his relatives. Naturally, she felt insulted. When she said no to the proposal, her husband then told her that she had no choice. She was going to participate in the wife swap whether she wanted to or not. What he hadn't expected was to be bashed in the head with an iron rod. No wife swap for him, not now and not ever. But just wait, this twisted tale of murder has a few more twists. The pair had been married for about five years and frequently argued over a property dispute. People close to the case have claimed she didn't murder her husband out of anger, but because she was trying to get rid of him so she could get her hands on his property. This probably isn't true though, considering the details surrounding the killing itself. She had waited until her husband fell asleep to do the crime. She crept into the room, stood above the bed where he was sleeping, and brought down the iron pipe on his skull. She kept hitting him until his head looked like a mashed watermelon. Immediately after, she called the police and told them what she did. For her, keeping her dignity and killing her husband was worth more than participating in his perverted fantasies. Number 3. Secret Thievery A woman has been sentenced to serve 18 months in prison after getting caught stealing over $900,000 from her husband and her husband's family. The man hasn't revealed his identity, as this is probably pretty embarrassing for him but he has given reporters all the juicy details about his wife and the case. He says she was extremely organized and great at setting up things like appointments and coordinating support for his elderly mother. He naturally trusted his wife, and so it seemed like a good idea for her to keep track of his parents' finances as they got older. The problem was that instead of looking after their finances, she was stealing it. It became a massive issue when his mother realized something was wrong with her bank accounts. She discovered credit cards in her name that shouldn't have existed. And when the husband confronted his wife about the accusations, she ran out of the house like a common thief and never went back. The husband was forced to contact the authorities, who learned that she had embezzled almost a million dollars. The husband, after getting this bombshell dropped on his head, then learned that his income taxes had never been filed. His mortgage hadn't been paid, and his wife had been stealing all that money instead with the intention of leaving him. Thankfully, you just can't get away with this kind of thing in this day and age. The police were easily able to track the fleeing wife down and arrest her. All the money she embezzled was taken away, and she was sent to jail for a year and a half on charges of fraud. Number 2. A Deadly Rumor The woman who killed her husband with boiling water has been sentenced to life in prison. Her name is Corina Smith from England, and she killed her husband after hearing a rumor about him that she thought was true. It was July 14, 2020, the day before Karina had heard a rumor that her husband was a sexual predator who had a problem with abusing children, including the son they shared together. She was distressed beyond belief about the rumor, especially since their son had died way back in 2007. She began thinking that her husband had something to do with their child's death. She was so mad that she filled the bucket with boiling water and bags of sugar. As her husband lay in bed, she poured the boiling sugar water onto his arms and torso and then ran away to a neighbor's house and called the police. When the police arrived, they found her husband Craig Baines in serious distress. 
the skin of his torso and arms was already peeling off as the boiling sugar water, basically 300 degree syrup, stripped away his flesh. He went to the hospital, was marked in stable condition for two weeks, but ultimately passed away. Because of the cruel, painful, and barbaric way that Karina killed her husband, she was charged with murder and given life. Only after 12 years of prison will she be eligible for parole. As for that rumor she heard, nobody has any idea if it's true. Now that Craig Baines is dead, it's hard for the police to prove any allegations against him. We'll never know if he really was a pervert or if he got burned for no reason. Number 1. Fake Kidnapping In yet another bizarre case of kidnapping, this one coming straight from Kenya, a woman has tried to extort her husband. But in this case, it's a little different. It involves the woman faking her own kidnapping to get money from her husband. The husband received a call from an unknown individual saying that they had his wife and that they needed a large ransom of cash. The husband quickly filed a missing persons report with the police and began trying to raise enough money to send to the kidnappers. He couldn't put it all together, but he got quite a bit and sent it over in hopes that they would let her go. Unbeknownst to everyone, the woman had eloped with a cab driver and was hoping to squeeze her husband for all he had before getting rid of him. But she didn't tell anyone else about the scheme meaning that even her own relatives were gathering money for her release. The kidnappers, meaning the wife and her new boyfriend, ended up with even more cash than they had originally asked for. But like every half-baked scheme, this one came to a dramatic end. The police had been tracking the supposed kidnapping and weren't convinced it was real. They tracked the woman down and discovered her with a new boyfriend and all the cash they'd stolen from the duped husband and the woman's family. Suffice to say, she didn't get to keep any of the money. Sad, a bad stunt. In Hawaii, it is illegal to jump off most volcanoes. Yet on the island of Kauai, a man jumped directly off the top of Walua Falls because he didn't think it looked that far down. He thought it would be a wild stunt he could easily pull off to impress his friends. In reality, the falls is much taller than it looks, at 200 feet, and the guy nearly died. His name is Shiloh Sheehan. He had moved to Hawaii from California just about two years before the incident. Before he moved back to California, his local friends took him to Wailua Falls as part of his going away celebration. When they got to the waterfall itself, Shiloh and his friends could see that the area was clearly fenced off. There were signs everywhere warning people to stay away from the edge. All the same, Shiloh said he was compelled to break the rules and jump off the edge. His friends even filmed his flight down, including the painful smack when he hit the water below. Ouch! According to what Shiloh said, he pointed his feet so that he didn't do a belly flop. But he had his head craned in such a way that when he hit the water, his head snapped back and he was knocked out cold. The only reason he survived was that a few tourists from the bottom swam out into the middle of the waterfall and pulled him back to shore. Amazingly, he only had a few torn muscles and wasn't even injured. 9. Teenage Tragedy in one of the worst waterfall disasters of all time, 20 high school students were killed while swimming at a waterfall in Ghana. But what makes this case really strange is that the students didn't all go over the edge of the falls and break their bodies at the bottom. Instead, they were killed by falling trees that were uprooted during a sudden storm. The students were swimming at Kintampo Waterfall a popular area for picnickers in Ghana. Wind and heavy rain came out of nowhere, causing massive trees to tip over and literally land on the high school students who had been relaxing in the pool. The thing is that the students were at the bottom of the waterfall and the trees that were being uprooted were landing in the river above. The water from the river spilled over the waterfall, normally cooling off the locals. But because the trees had gotten tossed into the river, suddenly they came hurtling off the side of the waterfall like live bombs. Within a handful of seconds, 20 students had been crushed to death by trees falling over the falls. 
According to the head teacher and one of the witnesses of this terrifying tragedy, the students had actually gotten trapped by a wall of trees before they could ever escape. A few trees came down, the students realized what was happening and tried to get away, but so many trees were falling that it created a barricade. They were stuck in the pool like a bunch of spiders in a toilet bowl. There was nothing they could do as the trees came tumbling down on their heads, as if a beaver dam had broken right above them. In the end, 20 lives were lost. 8. The Final Adventure A trio of friends who got famous on social media for traveling around the world and chronicling their experiences have met a rather unfortunate end. After traveling through some of the most dangerous countries in the world, they ended up having their final adventure in the relatively safe country of Canada. They died after an accident at Shannon Falls, just about 35 miles from Vancouver in British Columbia. The trio included Charles Riker Gamble, Alexei Yayak, and Megan Scrapper. They had hundreds of thousands of followers online, they were sponsored by brands that promote travel and adventurous lifestyles, and their corpses were found floating in a pool at the bottom of the waterfall. According to the Canadian authorities, all three of them fell about 100 feet to their deaths while they were swimming at the top of the waterfall. Their deaths, while extremely tragic, also brought up an issue about thrill-seeking for the sake of gaining likes and followers. In the aftermath of the accident, it came out that these people had pled guilty to charges related to poor behavior throughout several national parks in the U.S. And this is straight from the National Park Service. Nobody knows what the friends were doing at Shannon Falls, but they very well could have been up to no good. The Squamish search and rescue team believed they were swimming when one of them got pulled by the current the others tried to rescue them before they went over the falls, and then all three were dead. 7. The Deadly Laurel Fork Falls A teenager from Florida died after falling 80 feet down the Laurel Fork Falls in South Carolina. His horrifying death is made even more shocking because he was only 14 years old. He hadn't been trying to do anything wrong, he wasn't trying to take selfies, and he wasn't breaking any rules. He was simply hanging out at the top of the waterfall when he slipped on something wet, fell down, tumbled over the edge, and then cracked his brains open on the rocks below. According to the Pickens County Coroner, he died at the scene from blunt force trauma. His name was Isaiah Oertel, and he was the second person to die at the Laurel Fork Falls in 2020. Before this, a woman named Taylor Coleman also slipped from the top of the falls and died when she hit the bottom. Only 30 miles from Greenville, Laurel Fork Falls seems to be one of the most dangerous recreational places in the whole state. But what do you think about Laurel Fork Falls? Have you ever visited this North Carolina death trap? And if you haven't, would you hike the waterfall here knowing people continuously slip and die at the top? Let us know in the comments, and if you're liking this video, be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe buttons if you haven't already. 6. Over the Edge In a truly tragic incident, a man from Utah died while hiking near the Bridal Veil Falls with his fiancée and her 9-year-old son. The woman and her child are perfectly okay, but 40-year-old Adrian Vanderclis is being put in a coffin. According to the Utah County Sheriff's Office, Adrian was hiking with a young boy when he slipped on some unstable material above the falls itself and fell down. He slipped and plummeted from an elevation of roughly 5,800 feet, but he didn't hit the bottom of the falls, instead landing on a vertical slope, a kind of jagged piece of rock sticking out of the sheer cliff. Search and rescue workers could only reach his body using a helicopter. They actually had to call the operation off because it got too dangerous with nightfall, finally rescuing his body the next day. As for his fiancée and her child, he had been walking alone with a boy when the accident happened. The child was left to climb back down the mountain by himself to get to where his mom was camped out. Luckily, this was a very brave nine-year-old. He made it to safety and was able to report what happened to Adrian. 5. 
Selfie fail. A social media influencer from Hong Kong has been killed by her own insatiable desire for selfies. She was described by the New York Post as an Instagram star. Her name was Sophia Chung, and she was just 32 years old when she died. She and some friends went to the Ha Pak Lai Park early on a Saturday morning to do some climbing and take some adventurous photographs. When they reached the waterfall on Pineapple Mountain, Sophia knew that she had to take a photograph at the very edge. It didn't even seem that dangerous since the pool of water is only about 16 feet from the top of the waterfall. People fall over 200 feet and still survive, yet Sophia died from a fall less than one-tenth of that. The influencer's friends were able to call the emergency services and they quickly arrived, but she was pronounced dead upon her arrival to the hospital. Some say it was really just a matter of time considering some of the extremely risky photos that she took. Her specialty was capturing photos on the edges of cliffs, high up where a single misplaced step could spell disaster. She even photographed herself hanging from the edge of a cliff, holding on with nothing but her fingertips. For people like these, the truly shocking part is when they actually go on to live a full life. You can't just stand on the edge forever without ever expecting to fall off. 4. A Quick Slip At a California waterfall, a mother slipped and had an accident. It happened at Lake Tahoe when Stephanie Williams was hiking with her girlfriend at Eagle Falls. This is close to Emerald Bay. Everything was fine until Stephanie lost her footing and tumbled over sideways. At the time of her fall, she was a mother to two teenage boys, 12 and 14. She was the core of her entire family, according to what her brother told ABC News. Her whole family is now in disarray with her loss. Her brother also told authorities that she wasn't trying to take a selfie at the time of her death. It was just a weird accident that could have happened to anyone. Still, the authorities at Lake Tahoe are warning people about getting too close to the edge of their waterfalls. Even if it doesn't seem dangerous, one loose rock can spell disaster. If you're too close to the edge when you trip, that's the end of your life. Eagle Falls is only about 80 feet high, but that's still high enough to kill. Stephanie hit the ground like a doll made from thin twigs and broke so bad there was nothing the doctors could do to save her. 3. A Haunting Photo at Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe, Roy George Renashi de Kenye was taking photos of his family. They were all taking photos together from the very edge of the falls. Sadly, when it was Roy's turn to take a picture, he stepped a little too close to the edge and fell right over. A woman screamed, there was abrupt panic, and Roy was gone. The only thing that remained of Roy was a terrifying photo from the very second right before he fell 350 feet to his doom. He got the picture he wanted, standing on the rocks at the biggest waterfall in the world in nothing but a pair of sandals. Those rocks he was standing on were extremely slippery though, and sandals aren't exactly the proper footwear for wandering astride a giant waterfall. According to rescuers with the Zimbabwe National Parks and Wildlife Authority, it was too misty and raining too much for them to search for Roy right away. They had to put off the rescue attempt for a little while, until the weather was better. When they finally did go looking for him, they found various parts of Roy scattered at the bottom of the gorge, wedged between rocks. It looked as if when he fell, his limbs got trapped on the rocks and tore away from the rest of his body. He was in such terrible shape that they couldn't even positively identify him, though they are certain that it was Roy whose body they found. 2. Hugged to Death Yosemite National Park is one of the most beautiful yet terrifying parks in all of the United States of America, especially considering how many people die in climbing accidents. But climbing isn't the only cause of death here. Not so long ago, Hormiz David, Nikos Yakum, and Ramina Badal fell from the top of Vernal Fall and died. According to the eyewitnesses who watched the victims go over the edge, two of them were holding on to each other in a final bear hug as they fell 317 feet to their deaths. How did three people manage to fall over at the same time? 
According to those same eyewitnesses, the three of them entered the water above the falls, located not more than 25 feet from its precipice. The witnesses were screaming, yelling at them to get out of the water, but it seemed like they just didn't quite understand. They had been seen earlier climbing over the barricade to take pictures at the edge of the waterfall. The witnesses had screamed at them to go back to the safe side of the barricade, which they did. But shortly later, they hopped over the barricade again and made their way to a rock in the middle of the river to take photographs. The woman in the group slipped, her friend reached for her, his friend reached for him, and all three ended up in the water being swept over the edge of the falls. 1. Their Survivor in Tennessee, a local woman named Kim Hembry miraculously survived a terrifying tumble down the face of a waterfall. She was enjoying a leisurely bicycle ride with her husband down a trail famous for its waterfalls. And like almost every other person we talked about today, she stopped to take a picture at the top of one of the waterfalls. At the time, it was dry. There wasn't even any water flowing down it. She started to take pictures while her husband tried to get her away from the edge. He felt that something could go wrong at any second. But sadly for her, she didn't listen and something did go wrong. Kim slipped off the edge and fell somewhere between 35 and 40 feet. Her husband shrieked, immediately called for help, and then made his way down the waterfall to where his wife laid seemingly dead. But Kim wasn't dead. She was horribly injured, but still alive. She had a gash across her face, her right ankle was broken, her right leg was shattered, and her L5 vertebrae was fractured. In the end, she had to get a bone graft from the top of her leg to reconstruct a bone in her ankle. Plus, her nose had smashed all the way through her skull because she hit a fallen tree at the bottom of the waterfall. The swelling in her face was so bad because of this that doctors feared performing surgery would cause an infection that could spread to her brain. She did survive in the end, and although she isn't terribly disfigured, she'll have some pretty rough scars for the rest of her life. Would you be more suspicious of someone who's changed their name several times with no good explanation for it, or someone who has no relationship with their family and simply claims that they're not close without providing any additional details? Let us know in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye!